Jay Leno's Garage. A bit of Porsche royalty here, the 1988 Porsche 959. This is the car that sort of broke all sorts of technical barriers for Porsche. This was a, a, literally a rolling laboratory for almost everything you see in Porsche now. All-wheel drive, 450 horsepower, engine management, all kinds of trick stuff. I think these are hollow spoke magnesium wheels. I mean, just all kinds of really neat stuff on this car. It was just about a 200 mile an hour car. There's a lot of debate about this. The history books will tell you the Ferrari F40 was the first car to officially break 200, but a lot of people think, no, no, this one actually did it. Well, let's find out from the man who owns it, Alex Grappo. Alex, come on in. Hey, Jay. Beautiful nice to meet you. car, beautiful car. You know, one thing I always say in the Porsche Ferrari rivalry, Ferrari guys brag about how few miles they have in their cars. Porsche guys brag about how many miles they have on their cars. How many you got on this thing? So this car has just about 47,000 kilometers on this car. Okay. So it's had a, uh, a real life where it's been driven and used as the engineers dreamed it would be. And it really was. This was, I'm trying to think of what would, like the iPhone of the day, it was that sort of a technological breakthrough, wasn't it? I mean, most cars were still, even the F40, is, which is a car I keep referring to, but pretty basic, had twin turbos, but a manual transmission, rear wheel drive, nothing especially complex about it, just a fascinating car, interesting car. Whereas this was like a rolling laboratory, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and this car really was rocket science. When you read about the development of this car, uh, it truly was one of the first cars, too, that Porsche engineers took all over the world. There's some incredible photos of this car testing up in the Arctic and German engineers, you know, again, taking it all over the world. So they really said that, you know, we want a supercar that's going to be faster than almost anything on the road. But we also want it to work in every condition imaginable, including off-road. Right. And 1988 was a long time ago. I don't believe there was anything else on the road with 450 horsepower. I think the Countach, let me see, my, yeah, well, mine's an 86, and I think that was, yeah, that's about 450. Pretty close, pretty close, but certainly not as technologically advanced as this. Yeah, and I think so. It's, uh, this car is really a car that, it, it's not just about the numbers, too. It's really how it did everything. So when you talk about 450 horsepower in this versus a Countach, you know, we still use this car to go and get groceries with my girlfriend and her daughter in the back seat. Uh, you know, we'll take it out to dinner, no problem, and pick up something from the hardware store on the way back. So it, it was really about having all that power and all that technology, but it actually being something that you could use every day and carry more than one other person in. For example, the Countach weighs about 4,000 pounds. At least that's what it says on the Georgia, mm -hmm. which is really a heavy car. This has all sorts, this has Kevlar, and all sorts of material, which we take for granted now, but 30 years ago was pretty innovative. Oh yeah, it was absolutely space age material. As you mentioned earlier, the wheels are hollow spoke magnesium wheels, center locking. This car was also one of the first car to feature run flat tires. And the reason that it had run, run flat tires on it is because this was the first car to hit the close to 200 mile per hour barrier. Uh, they were actually at that point really worried about what a blowout or something like that would do at those sure. speeds, which is why they put the run flat tires on it. So it would actually be something that you could regularly drive at ultra high speeds on the Autobahn and do so safely. And in fact, another thing they did to ensure safety was that this car had a very special windshield, in fact, which was designed to be an anti-shatter windshield so that if a rock hit the windshield at 190 plus miles an hour, you also didn't have to worry about that. Really? I, I never heard that before. Now, are these tires still being made or are these modern versions of those early run flats or are these run flats as well? So these are run flats as well. And in fact, these Bridgestone tires, I believe they've slightly modernized the compound, but the tire is still made to this day. And in fact, it's still available from Tire Rack. Oh, that's interesting. And they were Bridgestones back then too. They were Bridgestones back then. Well, I believe it was called a Dunlock. That's interesting that Porsche would use uh, Bridgestone at the time. You think they would have gone with one of the German tire manufacturers. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think it came down to that run flat technology, which was really important to the engineers at the time. The other thing too is they were worried about somebody being able to change a flat uh, when it was a center lock wheel. Right. The other thing is it remains a Porsche. Even people who know nothing about cars would look at this and go, oh, that's a Porsche, right? Which, which one is that? What is that? I mean, you know, you see the heritage in it, you know, in the dashboard and in the steering wheel and, and just 
you can see a 9-11 hiding in here somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it's actually one of the worst things about this car because when you drive this car around on the street, uh, as we all know, it's something pretty special. But to the average person who's tailgating you or cutting you off in traffic, <laughs> they just think it's an old, old Porsche regular one. And, and so people don't, the car doesn't get a whole lot of respect on the road, which <laughs> makes for slightly nervous driving. Yeah, yeah, but the people who know go crazy. Well, and yeah. that's actually one of the things that makes this one of the most fun cars uh, I've ever driven is that uh, you really see who the true enthusiasts are because right. people will chase you down a couple miles through traffic or run through a grocery store parking lot to come say hi and get a look and take a picture. And so again, you really, uh, to see people that passionate and it brings back a lot of childhood memories for a lot of people too. So that is what makes does it Does it say 959 on it anywhere? I don't even know. No, you know, it actually does not say it anywhere uh, see, except see, for on the steering wheel. See, if this is America, you would have 959 <laughs> twin turbo you know, painted on the side and there'd be a giant chicken on the hood and there'd be all kinds of stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I think the original owner deleted that option uh, on, on the spec sheet. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a pretty modest car in typical German Well, fashion. I do love how understated it is. You know, my F1 McLaren is the same thing. You drive it and people just think it's a, oh, it's some kind of car. Was that Corvette or something? No, 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 no. <laughs> they don't know, but people who know, then we'll follow you home and you have to talk to them for hours. Yeah, exactly. And I will say, you know, one of the really cool things about this car <coughs> is, you know, up until kind of the mid 2000s, this other than the McLaren F1, this really was the only ca other car that you could do about 200 miles an hour in with more than one other person in the car. And of course, there's no such thing as carbon discs at the time. So this is steel, correct? Steel brakes. And I got to say, they're some of the best brakes I've ever experienced. Yeah, I always, you know, I, steel brakes are really underrated. When I bought my McLaren, uh, uh, MP4 12C, I ordered the, uh, you know, the carbon fiber, and the guy said, you gonna track this? He goes, no, save 20 grand, you don't need them. I go, really? No, you don't. And it's the best decision I've ever made. They work fine, you don't have to get them hot first, and they stop all it. Yeah, these just work all the time. And in fact, a uh, very interesting side note is that during the development, the braking system, this was one of the first cars to feature ABS. And coming up with an a ABS system that would be fully functional at around 200 miles an hour was actually one of the biggest design challenges of this car. And the system was actually malfunctioning for some time during the development, and they had a couple of really sketchy incidents with it. But the result is now the brake system is just absolutely fantastic. Um, there's some word that it came out of a couple of notable Porsche race cars, um, some of the components did, and, and you really feel it. It's extremely direct, and this car is quite heavy. Something that you pointed out to me, because I didn't want to point it out, I said, oh, look, I've got a little dimple in the door there. I don't want to say anything. But then like an idiot, I said, ooh, it looks like you got a little dimple in the door there. But you tell what that is, because that's fascinating. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of really interesting quirks on the 959, and I think a lot of people see this car as uh, pure mechanical and engineering perfection. And actually, the more time you spend with the car, the more you realize there's a very human element to the car, which when you start peeking under the hood or in the engine bay or around the interior, you see things that were really the sign of engineers that were on a tight budget, you know, really working to save the 911 and doing things as fast as they could. And so one of the signs of this car is actually that the door is imperfect and there's usually dimples right under the side mirrors in the door or a slight ripple that you can often see. And that's really just a result of the materials that they were using um, once they mounted the mirror it just created those dimples in the door. And that's actually now, in a lot of the 959s that have been repainted, um, I don't even believe they know how to replicate it. So it's one of the ways that you know the 959 is original and has not been repainted, is when you see those dimples in the door. Okay, let's walk around the car some more. Uh, can, let's, can we open the, the rear hood? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, you're not going to be changing the plugs in an afternoon, are you? No, that's one of the things about Porsche. How do you even, I guess you have to take the wheel off, huh? You know, I've never done it myself, but uh, yeah, I'd imagine it's probably uh, a bit of a task. Well, nice thing is because it's a Porsche, you don't have to do it very often. Yeah, no, this thing's extremely reliable and fires up every time, even if it's been sitting for a while. Right, right. Very nice. God, it's hard to believe it's now 31 years old. People often ask, what's it like to drive? And uh, the answer is honestly a little bit underwhelming to people sometimes because the best way you can describe it is really just saying that it drives a lot like uh, a modern Porsche. Right. And so it feels quite modern in many ways as what well. What do we have here? 
So what you have here in the engine bay is your controls for the access doors for both suspension fluid as well as the motor oil. So okay. because this car has a fully hydraulic adjustable suspension system, it does run on a specialized suspension fluid. And those, the door to that is on the side of the car and the flaps here open what, the door on one side, which is for suspension fluid, and the right. other side, which is for the oil. So these open? Correct. I see. So when you open that, it pops open the door on the side. Oh, I see. OK. Oh, I, I get it. Yeah. So if we open this one here, yeah. uh, you'll see there's the well, access Of course, that's point. to protect you from some idiot at a gas station. Yeah, pumping Kinda. gas into your suspension yeah, system. Hey, put some gas. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, on the subject of that, the suspension system on this car is, to be honest, one of the, the greatest sort of party tricks of the 959. And it's really a system that pioneered what we see on a lot of modern cars, which is adjustable suspension, um, adjustable ride height suspension. So this car can raise up and down several inches. And it was really designed to, again, all with the idea of it being a usable supercar. So, right. you know, you could drive it home at 195 miles an hour on the Autobahn from the office. And then when you get to your country house, you turn the suspension to the highest setting, you turn off down your gravel road, and you got nothing to worry about if there's a few potholes along the way. Really cool. And this is the comfort model. They, had, they, they sold it in two versions, right? Correct. This is a comfort model, um, and again, just like the word says, although it is comfort with a K, which lets you know it's a very serious German version of comfort. Or somebody's uh, a really bad speller. <laughs> one yeah. or the other. Yeah. Um, so what that means is that on this car, um, it does feature the adjustable suspension. It's a little bit heavier. Um, and then when the F40 came out and sort of took the title of world's fastest car, Porsche had put so much work into this, they said, look, all the ingredients are there. We can't allow Ferrari to take this title. And uh, so they produced the S model. What they did with that was they removed the adjustable suspension, which saved an enormous amount of weight. Right. Um, also created more direct handling and a stiffer ride. Um, they replaced a lot of the interior uh, materials and leather with a lighter cloth and then put a roll cage in it. They, in fact, actually also deleted the rear, uh, the, the, the right side mirror from the car on the Sport model really? as well. Uh, so you can tell a Sport model because it'll be missing a right um, side mirror. Um, and that car, uh, there are some stories that different models of the Sport uh, produce different horsepower according to what the owner wanted. So there's uh, several different versions of the story out there about which was fastest or were not, although it's, it's well documented that nine, the 959 Sport models were then hitting 211 miles an hour. Wow. You know, I like the Comfort model. I just like it because it's what the car was originally designed for, and it has all the all the options, the race and the suspension, and all the things that, that you would expect. You know, that's kind of what they do. They build the ultimate version, and then they charge you more to take stuff out, you know. <laughs> and I never quite understood that, you know. For the extra speed, I mean, they say that the, the S models were a little over 500 horsepower in most trims. And, um, you know, to get that ex extra 10 miles an hour, I mean, the 200 mile an hour badge is, is a very nice thing to have. But at the end of the day, most owners will probably never see that speed. Yeah. And it's not a nice badge to have if a cop has given it to you. Very yeah. true. Yeah. Very yeah. true. Well, it depends who you get it from. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you get it from the Porsche Club. Oh, that's really nice. You got it from Officer Harrington. Oh, boy, you're going to jail. Yeah, it's not good. Actually, a very good friend of mine was just pulled over on Mulholland, apparently by an officer who was part of the Porsche Club. Oh, really? And uh, I heard it went quite well. Oh, good. Yes, good. Well, yes. So good. that actually can happen. That's it. Yeah, it can happen. Well, good. It always happens to somebody else. But yeah, yeah, very good. Very good. OK. Uh, let's see what, can we open the front? What's, what's under the front? Is there any luggage space or storage space? So if we open the front hood here, you'll see that it's got some space. Right. But, you know, pretty much just enough for, uh, you know, fold up garment bag or maybe a couple of briefcases. Yeah, yeah. I, I just like how Porsche owners have to keep stressing the practicality of it. Like you're explaining to the wife, you know, Lamborghini and Countach guys, Ferrari guys, there's no practicality at all. You would just drive. But no, you see, you really can carry stuff. Look, honey, if you fold down the rear, you can put stuff in there. It oh. just makes me laugh. Yeah, and if you fold up the rear seats, you can fit two car seats back there. So, yeah, see, fact, I just, I like the Elvis's coffin look in here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And one of the cool things about this car is because the fuel cap is located up there, it's got a real interesting smell of gas uh, vapors over the years that have kind of been absorbed by the carpet around there. So oh. it's a mixture of deep pile 80s carpet and gas vapors, which is an uh, interesting smell. So don't smoke when you open the trunk is what you're I wouldn't suggest it. No, no. I remember at the gas station not far from here, there's a kid working there and I was putting gas in my car and he comes out and he's smoking, he's watching me. 
I said, hey, be careful with that cigarette. And he goes, oh, it's okay, I work here. I go, it doesn't make a difference if you work here. What does that have to do with anything? It's just stupid. But this is really, this looks so un like this kind of material. Yeah, and you know, again, I, I think when you, when you look actually inside um, this compartment on the car, it's one of those areas where you realize the engineers were so busy tackling the major problems of the car, like the braking right. system and the suspension and some of the aerodynamics, that this is something that was really sort of a final thought where they just, you know, they, I can't even count how many different pieces of fabric have been yeah, pieced together in there, here. Yeah. And um, they actually still don't even fit together as, a, as Porsche pieces typically do. Um, but you could tell again that this is one of the really human aspects of the car where you, they really just needed to get the project done and get the car. Yeah, I mean, customers. this all looks like it came out of the Winnie the Pooh factory. You know? <laughs> they had a few bears left over, so we put this in, in here. Yeah, if it was a little bigger, you could probably take a nap in here and it'd be pretty comfortable. That's how deep it is. It is deep. And the other interesting thing is the fact of lack of any chrome or even stainless, you know, like around here. Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because there's really there's no bright work on the car at all maybe the exception of the wheels and those are painted correct yes absolutely and these are your washers in here correct yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. so you can reach that so you obviously you can reach the you can open that from the inside yeah well what happens is when the hoods close there's a release button up front uh, which is actually uh, a little one of the trickier aspects of the car yeah. to operate it's a pretty stubborn switch but it pops open that cap um, then you'd feel it up like any other car while cool. trying not to spill gas all over the fenders. Well, it's really fascinating. This is one of these cars that has always intrigued me. And I remember when they came out, they were, well, I think they were $400,000, maybe four, Somewhere around there. Which now, you, you won't get one for twice that, actually. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And it's just, you know, the, the thing about this car, and again, one of the things that just makes it so much fun to take out is that it's really just an important part of Porsche's history. In fact, it's often referred to as the car that saved the 911. Yeah. It was initially developed, the idea for, for it came out of the early 1980s during the times of Group B, and that's why it's got a lot of these really trick features, was to really beat the Lancia 037 and the Audi Quattro and that's why they said, let's give it a real powerful twin turbo engine, a really trick advanced four wheel drive system and crazy suspension. And unfortunately by the car encountered uh, quite a few delays and by the time it was ready, Group B was, was actually over. Yeah. Um, which is then why the engineer still wanted to prove that it had the capability and it was run at, at the Dakar rally where um, oh, I actually- I remember that car, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where these cars actually, um, in the second year that it was run, um, it was run one year where they didn't do that well uh, without turbochargers. Uh, when they went back the next year, I believe it was 1986, they ran the car with the turbochargers and the cars placed first and second in the Dakar rally. And even the support car placed sixth. Wow. Now, have you always been a Porsche guy? Um, I appreciate cars that have a great story behind them. Right, and right. this is one of those great stories. Cool, cool. Now, what do you do? Are you in the car business? You know, I actually am in the coffee business and uh, we have a coffee company called Drive Coffee where we actually make ultra premium coffee inspired by great cars and great places. Oh, okay. Well, you must sell a lot of coffee because these are not cheap. These, these, these must You know, be people, <laughs> people drink a lot of coffee yeah. and uh, people love our products, which is great. And so... Is that what that... I th I see, I thought that was... Is that a can of oil or is that... What is that? Yeah, you know, uh, it's actually... Uh, I would not advise pouring it into the oil oh, is this flap your, oh, over is, on this the is, other this side. Is you know, I thought this and I go, why, would he, why didn't he keep the oil in, in, the, in, you know, in the front or in the back somewhere? Okay, but it's not. It's actually, it's actually coffee. Yeah, so that was actually the idea, is that we actually roast all of our coffees uh, pretty much the day before it ships out to the customer. So oh, it's okay. all freshly roasted. Cool. And um, Well, that's funny. Well, that's kind of funny. Well, let's, uh, let's get some caffeine and take it for a ride. Yeah, let's do Can it. do that? Cool. Oh, it should be exciting. Starts right up, no problems. I mean, this was so crazy when it came out. It was just like the iPhone. It just did so many things that the cars didn't do. Yeah, and I think too, you know, what makes a car really special is a car that provides the owner confidence 
and the more confidence it, it can provide you in the more areas, right. the more special the car is. And a lot of track focused cars, you know, they, they deliver confidence on the track. And in fact, many times they deliver the exact opposite on the road. It can be twitchy or yeah. ride real rough. And what this car does that really makes it special is just confidence everywhere. It just does everything really, really well. And it's so nice to have a proper gearbox. That's why I bought my Carrera GT. Yeah, I know. And this gearbox is just a really smooth, lovely gearbox, especially once it gets warmed up. Well, you can feel the turbos when they start to pull you a little bit. Yeah, it's really fun. And it's quiet, quiet exhaust system. It's quite a quiet car, yeah, especially at speed. As you notice, the doors are really hard to close and whatnot. And it's just because the insulation on this car was right, so right. good. So you could cruise on the Autobahn pretty quietly and comfortably. Have you been on the Autobahn? I have, yes, not in this car, but in a couple other cars. I went there with a Corvette once, and all the German cars were voluntarily governed at 155. Oh, so yeah. at 170. You were the king of the road. Oh, yeah, hilarious. King of the road. And they went crazy for the Corvette because they just don't see them. It's yeah. Corvette, yeah. <laughs> now, do you have the gearbox over here or is it center? It's in the center. Okay. Yeah, it's a left hand drive. Well, it does pull, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's so linear. Really, really smooth power delivery. And well, you know, it, it, it doesn't come on like a bang. I mean, it's. It comes on forcefully. I don't really notice a lot of lag here. Well, it, I mean, it, you definitely feel the, the the bigger turbo kick in. But what you're feeling is that this car had two stage turbos. So the first turbo was designed to kind of eliminate lag at the lower RPMs. Right. And it was really designed to transition then to the other turbo. But I like that. Stage. I like feeling like, oh, I got my foot in it. Oh, now I got some extra. You exactly. know what I mean? Yeah, and it's really fun if you need to pass a car or something like that, just to sort of tee it up, get that second turbo all spooled up, and then you just go for your pass, and the thing just goes off your pocket. So this was the first car to have tire pressure monitoring, right? Yeah, I believe so, and it's funny because, again, this all came out of the uh, obsession with safety at 200 miles an hour. Right. And so they really wanted you to know if your tires weren't properly pressurized for it or if right. you had some kind of a leak when you were going on the Autobahn. And so uh, it's a very, very strange system that they used. And uh, still to this day, somewhat of a delicate system, but in fact, it did have it. And in this car, it still works fantastic. Um, another interesting thing about this car is that uh, this car, I believe, was one of the first that actually had different traction modes. Yeah. So you can actually control the mode, which adjusts the torque split in the six disc uh, center differential um, that actually uh, modulates torque between the front and the rear. So in the dry setting, which is what we're on now, it's optimized for dry roads. It's also got a rain mode, snow mode, and off-road. This was the first water-cooled based 911, correct? Had sure. water-cooled heads. Yeah, water-cooled heads on this car. Which was like a lot of Porsche fanatics. Hey, wait a minute, that's cheating, you know. Absolutely, uh, and to this day, um, you know, a lot of people, there are some Porsche people out there that see this car a little differently because of that. You know, it's funny when a manufacturer gets locked into a product, so much, like Harley Davidson, if they make other, anything other than a big V-twin, it's a cop, people get mad, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, the same thing with 911, you know, the 928 was a great car, but it was so different, it was so un 911 like it was just, it, it never really got the acceptance that it, that it deserved. Well, and the great irony in all that, of course, is it's, is it's only when Porsche actually moved to almost entirely based, well, entirely water-cooled, and even SUVs for that matter, right. that now they can, uh, continue to afford some of the best uh, race development. Right, right. You know, win and dominate. And the revs come quick once you get past five grand, don't they? Boy? Very fast. The aerodynamics in this car are very good as well. Usually they're screaming me to roll up the windows. But on this car, even with the window open, we're having a conversation at, at a reasonable speed. Yeah, they did a lot of work on the aero on this car. And in fact, one of the interesting things about this car too is if when you look underneath it, almost the entire uh, bottom of the car is covered under uh, uh, a flat, right. uh, 
classic machine. It's got a tub, yeah. And you'll never lose money on this car. These are really starting to come into their own, aren't they? They are, which unfortunately means a lot of them aren't really being driven anymore. Yeah, that's sort a of being stored away. And it's a shame, too, because they still make actually uh, great daily drivers, just as they did back in the day. You know, there are a lot of supercars from the period. You put your foot in it, and there'd be a lot of noise. And a lot of things shaking and happening. Yeah. But you're really not going that fast. Whereas this, it's so linear. Like right now, you just put your foot in it. And the turbos feel like the hand of God just pushing it down the road, you know I, what I mean? I like to call it the Starship Enterprise. Yeah, it does and, have that. Uh, I can fulfill my inner Trekkie uh, That's self fun. every time you, uh, you you really give it the gas in here. That it's kind of like that Star Trek scene where everything just suddenly gets blurry. Almost seems like you could put a sport exhaust on it. It's almost too quiet, isn't it? There's also a lot of insulation in this car. Yeah. But I can't believe just how modern the car is. It feels, it really feels like a modern 911. I mean, it's it's so advanced. You know, I've driven some things like, uh, like the Hennessy or those kind of things with just a big American engine, you know, yeah. tuned out to 1,500 horse or whatever it is. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> you know, and you know, the smoke and fury and, it, and you're moving really fast. But it's not, it doesn't feel like science, you know what I mean? And this really was the first true supercar. Um, you know, that's kind of what its claim to fame is. And, um, you know, I think probably will be for a very long time. Yeah. And, and the craziest thing is it's really the equivalent of, you know, it's the first supercar, but it's the equivalent of, they took the 918, the Dakar Rally, and they won. Right, And right. it just, you know, something like that will never, ever happen again. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for bringing this. This has been a real treat. It's, it's, it's really fun to kind of do the history of cars and the great cars throughout the decades. And certainly for the 80s, this has to be the greatest car of the 80s. It, it's just unbelievable. And it's amazing just how much technology came from this car. You know, I mean, the idea of water cooling the cylinder heads, which wasn't done in Porsche before, uh, the tire monitoring system, you know, the torque vectoring, the, the four-wheel drive. It's, it's just, it, it's really like a, an engineering lab on wheels. It really is terrific. And thanks for bringing this by. Really appreciate it. Not a problem and at good all. Good luck with your coffee. Come. That's drive coffee now. <laughs> you know, it's been an absolute pleasure to bring it here and drive with you today. And that's one of the best things about this car is it was really a time machine when it was built. It remains a time machine today to go back in time. And it does. And, you know, cars really bring people together because it's fun. I like all types of vehicles, you know, and this is really one of one of the most original cars ever. I mean, it just, I mean, original in concept and in execution, and they really got it pretty much all right the first time. I mean, there might have been some teething problems early on with these, but I don't remember anything major, you know. The basic engineering and everything was sound. Well, the development experienced quite a few delays. They'd originally planned to uh, released the car much earlier than they did. Yeah. So, but as a result, that meant that by the time the car was, uh, you know, released to the public, it was pretty much perfect. Well, this is about as good as it gets. Once again, thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Very cool. It's been I'm, a lot of fun. I'm sorry, I have to give this back. We got to go back <laughs> to the garage and see you guys next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>